Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today to take the taboo out of pelvic floor challenges and ways to overcome them. My name is Kristen Prusky, and I am proud to lead Sibley's Foundation as the vice president. Just so everybody knows, our webinar is being recorded today, and we look forward to sending that out to you later to share with family and friends who might not have been able to enjoy today's lecture live. Um, this afternoon, we're so lucky to have Dr. Daniel Gruber, who is the director of Sibley's Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery Program and an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins Medicine. He also has the proud distinction of being a retired colonel with the United States Air Force. Thanks, Dr. Gruber, for joining us. Additionally, we also have Lola Oye Bifan, who is a doctor of physical therapy, and she'll share some very valuable information for everybody joining us today. She is an outpatient physical therapist at Sibley's incredible rehabilitation center specializing in pelvic health. You hear a little bit more about each of our speakers' backgrounds and why we are so fortunate to have them join Sibley's incredible team here. You'll also have an opportunity to ask Dr. Gruber and Lola questions following their presentations. At the bottom of your screen, I know we're all have been Zoom savvy by now, but at the bottom of your screen, please use the Q&A feature, and that is how you can submit questions. Feel free to submit questions during their presentations, and we will work through them at the end of their talk. I'll transition it over to you, Dr. Gruber. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Um, just so you know, uh, Brittany, my nurse practitioner, is trying to get on. Um, I think maybe you have to let her in. Um, Anyway, but thanks for that introduction. I'm gonna share my screen now to kind of show the presentation. There we go. Okay, is my presentation up? Looking great. Okay, the full thing, okay, good. So um, this is, uh, I'm Daniel Gruber, as he, you had mentioned. Um, I have uh, Brittany Roberts, uh, who is my nurse practitioner, who uh, was seeing a patient until a couple minutes ago, so she's trying to get on as well. Um, so uh, this is just some of my background stuff, won't get into too much, but I've had a lot of experience most recently at Walter Reed for several years, um, and I was fellowship director there and started a, a urogynecology division at uh, Sibley Hospital in 2020 uh, until now. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go through some uh, the most common bread and butter topics that we have for for your gynecology, also known as female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery. Um, so urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, so we'll kind of, we'll go through those um, as those are the most common things. Um, so starting off with urinary incontinence, there's two types. There's stress incontinence, essentially leaking urine with coughing, laughing, sneezing, exercise, uh, various causes uh, such as age, childbirth is a big one, pregnancy, Anything that causes a lot of pushing like chronic constipation, there's also genetics involved as well. Um, and then the other type of leaking type urine uh, type situation is overactive bladder, also known as urge incontinence. And that's where there's a sudden loss of urine with a sense of urgency. So very commonly people will um, just be sitting there and they go, oh, I have to go right now. And they stand up, it gets worse and, and as they're working their way to the bathroom. Um, and so, and then sometimes they might even leak on the way. So these are caused by different things and that's therefore we uh, treat them differently. Um, and then a lot of people will have both actually. Uh, they'll have a component of stress incontinence and also overactive bladder. So going on to the stress incontinence, the different things that we uh, often talk about uh, with patients, especially at the first visit, we go through behavioral changes, um, things like, um, uh, like doing Kegels, which uh, is on the exercises there. So a lot of times we'll send people to pelvic floor physical therapy and Lola will talk to you about her side of that uh, thing. Um, we do pessaries, there's an over-the-counter called Impressa. We'll show a little bit about that, um, some pharmacologic, and then there's surgical and procedural options as well. Um, is Brittany on yet or not? No, okay. Um, so this is a pessary. It's a silicone device uh, that sits in the vagina. Um, you can see up here on the left um, that they, um, there's lots of different shapes and sizes. This one is specifically designed for incontinence with this little knob here. 
And this is what it looks like inside. It goes under the urethra. And then when somebody coughs or sneezes or laughs, it pushes on the urethra and prevents the leaking or minimizes it. Um, people don't have to do this option, but it is one of the options that they can do. Oh, Brittany, I think I can see you there. Um, and um, so we're just talking about pessaries now. Um, and then um, the other th option is Impressa, which is an over-the-counter version. Um, it uh, has, hi. And then, um, so this is an applicator. This is a throwaway everyday type device. And this, they have three different sizes. Uh, and this goes into the vagina, similar to the pessary. And um, again, also pushes up on that. The pessary is a little more environmentally friendly because you can use it for years. And people can use it as much or as little as they want. Sometimes people will use it just with exercise and running. Other people use it all the time. And Brittany will get into the, the pessary stuff when it comes to prolapse in a minute. Um, there's a couple different treatments that we can do procedurally. Uh, the most common thing we do is a mid urethral sling. This is a permanent material that goes underneath the urethra. There's a couple different methods of doing this. And it provides support for the, um, for the urethra, similar to the pessary, but this is done internally. These are highly successful, um, over 90% success, even out to 17 years, over 70% of people are still happy with this. Um, this is a bulking procedure where we take a camera inside the urethra and inject a substance around the sides of the urethra here to make it bulk up so it closes it down. Um, also pretty good as well. We, this traditionally doesn't last as long as the sling, um, but there's a newer one that we're working with that hopefully it, it uh, lasts a bit longer, like maybe a few years. Um, but both are very good options and lots of people get this and, um, and overwhelmingly people are very happy uh, that they're not leaking or not ne leaking nearly as much as they used to. Um, and it can really help people with activity and um, so they can get out more and exercise or some of the, some of the benefits of it. Um, so going back to urgency and overactive bladder, so like I said before, um, it's, this is where people get to feel a sudden need and they run to the bathroom. So we, when they come in, we, we get, go through the history, we do a physical exam and we wanna always get a urinalysis to make sure there's not an infection. The treatment options um, are behavioral as well, um, which can involve uh, intake of fluids. Sometimes people over drink, we see a lot of that in our population, um, certain types of, uh, Things people eat like citrus, uh, coffees, teas, caffeines, uh, and other things can irritate the bladder. Pelvic floor exercises are very, very important for this to try to hold it as long as you can. And we call it urge suppression. There's different pharmacologic uh, uh, options. I do a lot of pelvic, uh, sorry, bladder Botox, inject the uh, bladder with uh, Botox, which is a muscle relaxant. And then there is different types of electrical stimulation therapy. So basically what we tell people is when that urge hits, we tell them to freeze and squeeze, to hold still, do a Kegel. Hopefully you do that right. Um, on our initial exams, we're always checking to make sure that people can do a Kegel uh, well and they can coordinate their muscles because it's very common not to, to do it exactly right. So traditionally, um, there's the anticholinergic medications. These are all the different names. You might recognize some of them from commercials. Um, we, the FDA put a black box warning about these for older folks, typically over 65 or 70, so that they, because um, it can exacerbate dementia or cognitive issues, people who have risk for falls and things like that. Um, uh, I'm not a huge fan of these. I haven't given too many out in, in quite a long time. Um, for those reasons. And it has a bunch of other side effects people typically don't like. There's a couple in the newer group, uh, beta agonists, um, which uh, don't have those side effects. They work okay for um, overactive bladder. So a lot of people I like those. The, the big downside with these ones is that they're very expensive, um, even with the copays. So we run into that issue sometimes. Um, for Botox, essentially, it's an injection like this. We do it right in the clinic. It doesn't require um, an IV. 
or anything like that. We do offer um, Xanax or Valium for people. Not everybody takes it. We do a little bit of local anesthetic too, um, but it's very quick. We just poke the bladder um, a few times and then it's less than five minute procedure. And then typically it lasts six to nine months, which is very nice. People don't have to take a pill every day. Um, and it, uh, it is quite successful and the majority of people are quite happy with it. Um, other types of things are electrical stimulation therapy. Um, there's TENS units, which you can buy on your own, which are quite inexpensive. There's a tibial nerve stimulation with an acupuncture needle. And both those work fairly well um, and they're pretty easy to do. Um, then there's also an implantable device that I do, a sacral neuromodulation. And essentially there's different types. There's a newer one that's very small, as you can see, it's rechargeable. And it, it, there's a wire that hooks up to the nerve here that goes to the bladder and to the bowel. Um, and it, uh, it's uh, something that is a good long-term solution that doesn't require medications. This is what it looks like on x-ray. Um, okay. So that's it for the, um, the overactive bladder and stress incontinence, so the leaking side of things. Um, and I'm going to turn off that sound. I'm gonna play this. So this is just to show a little bit of anatomy. So the bladder, uterus, there's the vagina right there. There's the rectum and the sacrum, which is the lower part of the spine. And when people have prolapse, um, different parts of it can fall. We look at the front wall of the vagina, the back wall of the vagina, and the top where the cervix is. And yep, so that's that part. Okay, so it's very, very common. Um, half of women who've had babies will have some form of prolapse, some more than others, obviously but it's very, very common. Um, these are the different things that people can experience with prolapse, uh, anything from back pain. Vaginal bulge is a, is a very common thing. Uh, obstructive voiding, meaning that they can't empty their bladder very well. Uh, emptying bowels is, an, uh, is a problem as well. So we see these complaints all the time. So this is what it looks like when there's no prolapse, and this is what it looks like when the cervix is dropping down. Uh, this is after hysterectomy, so there's no uterus, and the top of the vagina can fall down sometimes too. Um, when the front wall, which is next to the bladder, falls down, this is what that looks like. And then the back wall, where the rectal side is, this is what this looks like. And stool can get stuck and caught and trapped into that pocket there. And a lot of our patients will have all three of these happening at the same time. Different things we can do. We don't have to do anything if, a, if it's very mild. Um, and then we do have different pessaries and we also have surgical options. So Brittany, you wanna talk about pessaries for a second? Hi everyone, I'm Brittany. I'm Dr. Gruber's nurse practitioner. Um, so for the pessary placements, if we decide that it's an option for you, you would come in for a different visit and meet with me. Um, there's multiple different ones that we have available in the office. So ultimately we'll go through an evaluation together and see which one would work best for you. Um, I know it can be scary to get something new. So what we do is I will go ahead and place it. And then while you're here, I can have you practice taking it out and reinserting it again. Um, it's really great. Either people will use it leading up to surgery um, just for some extra support or um, some people do really well with it and just continue to use it over the years. Um, so I do not use these scary looking ones off to the right hand side. Dr. Gruber really likes to use those um, for yeah. pictures, but um, <laughs> mine are much less scary that I play some people. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so the ones that we showed earlier uh, are what, what Brittany places for people and, and shows them. And, and the nice thing about it too is like if somebody doesn't like it, they don't have to use it. It's, no, it's nothing permanent. But these are historical ones, which I just like to show for comparison that, that the, the silicone rings that we use nowadays are much nicer. And when yes. Brittany fits them for people, they shouldn't feel it. That's 
people think you're going to feel that, but once it goes in, it can be a little uncomfortable going in initially, but once it's in, you shouldn't feel anything. Actually, you should feel better. Okay. Yes. Um, going on to some of the surgical options, there's different things that we can do that I do a lot of these to fix the bladder side. Um, we often are often do an anterior pair that's going in the vaginally with sutures. Um, and then this is the back wall of the vagina. Um, oh, sorry, this is, no, I think I got the wrong picture there, but this is, um, oh, I got them switched around. Sorry about that. So this is the bladder side getting this, the cystocele repair, and then this is the rectal side getting that repaired. One thing that we notice with uh, very commonly with the rectocele when the, the rectum comes down and bulges, not only do a lot of women have uh, obstructive defecation, so they still get stuck in here, um, but also there could be a lot of vaginal laxity, so decrease uh, sensation with sex because things are open. And part of this procedure is to make the opening of the vagina more normal. So hopefully they have better sensation with sex. Um, we have suture ligament suspensions to help with the top of the vagina. The sacrospinous is one option. Uh, hooking it into a ligament in the pelvis. Uterosacral ligament suspension is also similar. Hooking it the top of the vagina into, the, into a, a ligament up in the pelvis, a different one. Um, one of the more common procedures I do is called sacral copopexy. It's typically done laparoscopically with little incisions like this. And it's basically, we typically uh, do a hysterectomy because the uterus is in the way and then put a permanent material on the back wall and on the front wall of the vagina, hook it up to a strong ligament by the sacrum. Of the different prolapse surgeries we, surgeries we have, this one's the best one because it's using the material to hold everything up um, and not relying on ligaments that people have that have stretched out over time. Um, another very common procedure we do on uh, patients uh, in our population, and this is typically done for women who are older and who are essentially done with having uh, intercourse and don't have any desire for future intercourse. Um, so this shows you what prolapse looks like on the outside and the bladder dropping down, and as you can see, it's very hard often to empty the bladder. As it gets to this level, you can actually start to get kidney damage because often the urine will back up the ureters, which are the tubes that go to the kidneys. Um, and then it doesn't happen overnight, but over time they can get kidney damage. So in that case, it's, it's not as much, um, it's more urgent to get this fixed. Uh, and so in this surgery, basically I sew the front wall of the vagina to the back wall and close everything up. The uterus can stay in place sometimes and sometimes we remove it. This surgery is very, very successful. It's 99% successful. And um, it, uh, so this is what things look like at the end. So the external va vagina looks very normal. That's better than everything falling out like that. And this is just another image right here of, of what, what it looks like when we're finishing with the surgery. Um, so those are the bread and butter, uh, leaking urine and prolapse. Other things that Brittany and I will focus on too is we deal with a lot of uh, anal incontinence, any issues with difficulty urinating, bowel issues like we mentioned, atrophy, which is thinning of the vaginal tissues after menopause, especially we do recurrent UTIs. Uh, we'll work with pelvic floor spasms very commonly in conjunction with Lola and Alicia and the physical therapy. Um, we also help fix fistulas, which are our connection typically between like the bladder and vagina or the rectum and vagina. Um, and if somebody has a laceration after uh, delivering a baby, if things are uh, broken down or having some sort of complication, we'll help with those kind of things as well. Um, so that's that part. Um, and then this is our uh, location. We're at the at, on building D on the fourth floor. Uh, physical therapy department where Lola is, is on the four, first floor below us. Um, there's our phone number. Um, and that's kind of the big stuff. Um, Brittany, do you have anything else to add? Nope, okay. Not really. I mean, we work as a team and after the, um, if you do go to surgical option, I'm the one that will see you for the post-op follow-ups about six weeks afterwards, so. And, and I also want to thank like those people. We've had some nice donors in the past and we use those funds for 
helping patients and, and a lot of educational stuff. We were able to send our nurse practitioners to a really important uh, course recently, um, specifically focusing on these things. Um, and then we were able to buy dilators to uh, give to Lola and Alicia in the physical ther therapy department um, that so patients don't have to pay for those kind of things. And, um, and I'm purchasing some other small items too which is just very nice and makes it logistically a lot easier to, to help our patients out. So thank you so much for those kind donations. I thank you so much, Dr. Gruber and Brittany. I'll kick it over to you, Lola, for some more great information. Okay, let me just get my screen going for you. Can we see? We can, it looks great. Okay, perfect. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Gruber and Brittany for that informative information um, session. And I wanted to thank all of you guys for being here with us tonight. Um, just to recap, my name is Lola Oyebifan. I'm a physical therapist here at Sibley Hospital in the Outpatient Rehabilitation Center. I am here to help demystify what goes on with pelvic floor PT. Um, I want everyone to let go of the taboo about talking about pelvic floor dysfunction in public with your friends, with your families, and most importantly, with your healthcare providers. Um, I want to empower each of you to be able to feel comfortable and confident addressing your pelvic floor concerns. Um, so I am presenting today on behalf of the team of pelvic floor physical therapists that we have here at Sibley. Um, Alicia, Rudy, and I all work together closely with Dr. Gruber um, to give you guys the best care. Alicia and I are the ones that deal the most intimately with Dr. Gruber's patients, but I just wanted to point out that Rudy here takes the lead on our male physical, or sorry, our male pelvic floor patients. Um, more than 75% of the conditions discussed today um, can occur in males, so I just wanted to shout that out for anyone who has a male in their life that also might be struggling with pelvic floor dysfunction that they are able to also get treatment here at Sibley. Um, I wanted to point out that we are each doctors of physical therapy, meaning we've each successfully completed four years of undergraduate studies followed by three years of doctoral level graduate school education um, because a lot of times people don't realize that and they're surprised by how much we know and sometimes it just helps to remind you by how long we've had to uh, work on learning about it. Um, so what do we know as experts and the pelvic floor on the physical therapy side um, on top of what it takes to become a pelvic floor or on top of what it takes to become a physical therapist um, as pelvic floor physical therapist we go through even more training um, advanced training as it relates to the pelvic floor and its interaction with the rest of the human body we pride ourselves on being experts in your anatomy and physiology, so how your muscles and bones and nerves work together um, to help with every single function, whether that is getting out of a chair, coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, and how that can contribute, as Dr. Gruber said, to pelvic floor dysfunction, such as incontinence. Um, we know and understand the complex nature of your pain, how the nervous system can be impacted with or without physical injury, to um, kind of have some impairments in your function and how we can address that. To the right, you'll see kind of what we focus on with Dr. Gruber's office, which is the female pelvis. We're experts on those long forgotten little muscles of, that make up your pelvic floor. Those small muscles work together to support your pelvic organs, as well as assisting with your function when you're walking, um, your hips, your back, and all that. We combine our physical therapy knowledge with our pelvic floor knowledge to determine what might be impacting your function and what exercises and behavioral changes might be the most important for you to work on to improve that. So we titled this presentation, Don't Depend on Depends, because in the pelvic world it is very common misconception that um, as you age, reduced bladder or bowel function is just a given. Some people will say, well, you know, as I get older, I just wet myself, or I wake up four times to go to the bathroom because I have a small bladder. We hear that once you have a baby, sex will always be painful, or if you strain to have a bowel movement, that's okay as long as you're going every day because that means you're not constipated. And unfortunately, all those complaints are very common, but they're not normal. So just because you hear other people your age or people older than you may be saying that those are things that they experienced, those are all things that can be addressed um, with Dr. Gruber and Brittany's help as well as my own. 
A lot of times people end up seeing Dr. Gruber as kind of, they've seen three or four other practitioners before them that weren't able to help. And sometimes I think it's really important that people know that his services are available and our services are available um, as a first resort as opposed to a last resort. So what do we treat? Dr. Gruber briefly, or went over most of these, but um, as far as physical therapy is concerned, we tend to break up our conditions that we treat into three big groups. The first one is urinary. So bladder prolapse, as Dr. Gruber um, explained, overactive bladder, stress incontinence, which is when you have leakage, when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or lift something, um, urge incontinence, which is when you have leakage just by thinking or the sensation of going to the bathroom, as well as urinary retention, so difficulty emptying your bladder. Then we move on to colorectal conditions, so rectal prolapse, constipation, fecal incontinence, um, impaired defecation, so we again are working on coordination there, and then GI distension. So we actually do a lot of work in the abdomen away from the pelvic floor that people don't realize. So a lot of times our patients coming with pelvic pain, pelvic prolapse, they can have pain in other places that are pain or dysfunction in other places that we address. And then lastly, we kind of group everything else in the pain category. So that could be pain with intercourse, um, sexual dysfunction, uh, post-operative pain. So after people have surgery, typically a lot of, most of Dr. Gruber's patients are completely functional, but just working on being more comfortable and knowing what their new sensations might be down there after they have surgery. Um, like Dr. Gruber mentioned, uh, we see a lot of patients um, postpartum. So sometimes they'll have a postpartum laceration or they'll still have residual pain from their childbirth experience. And then we also treat a lot of patients with um, oncology diagnoses or just after potentially having like a bladder removal or radiation. So then on the slide here, I have the most common question that we have is what do you do in pelvic health physical therapy sessions? And the the most important answer I'm going to give is that we do way more than Kegels. So um, the majority of patients and even some practitioners think that pelvic floor physical therapy is just Kegels. And I promise you it's way more than that. Um, saying that pelvic floor physical therapy is just Kegels is like assuming that doing a bicep curl is the only way to treat your shoulder pain. Um, so just to simplify that. But what you can expect from coming to our office is that we'll start with a typical evaluation where we look at you from top to bottom. We will uh, look at the background of your symptoms when they started and how that is impacted by your medical history. We move on to screening questions that give us an idea of any red flags or points of concern to be mindful for with treatment. We believe, like Dr. Gruber said, there's no dumb questions and there's also no such thing as TMI with pelvic floor physical therapy. So we're spending a majority of our session discussing your bladder, your bowel, and your reproductive health. We're talking about what you're eating and drinking, how often you're going to the bathroom, and what you're going to see or what you are seeing when you're in there. Um, patients and the therapist work together to establish goals for therapy. Some of those goals might be, I don't want to wake up to use the bathroom three times, I don't want to have pain with intercourse, or I want to have regular bowel movements, whatever comes to mind and whatever is most important for you. Then we will decide um, out of the treatment interventions that I'm going to explain next, how best to incorporate that into your treatment plan. So what does a physical therapy session look like? It looks like a lot of things. <laughs> We're physical therapists, so we do um, a lot of exercise in general. We work on posture and body mechanics with everyone. Um, and we try to get you off the table so that we can relate how some of your pelvic floor functions might be um, impacted by the activities that you're doing. Um, you can see me there in the top right corner. I'm doing manual therapy on someone's foot. Um, we can work on the hips, the ribs, the back. They're all connected and they all um, impact your pelvic floor. Oftentimes we are looking at other parts of the body to make sure that the system is working its best as a whole. Um, next to that, I don't know if you can see my cursor, 
But next to that here, we have dilators and wands. So that's what Dr. Gruber mentioned. Um, we got foundation funds and we were able to use them so that we're able to provide patients with dilators um, so that they can work on some of the pelvic floor dysfunction that we might find. Um, the wands, we usually recommend patients purchase those, but we have a store of dilators for patients to take home with them and use. Um, the next picture, you'll see someone getting a typical internal exam or an internal treatment, and that's just you're draped, you're undressed from the waist down, and we don't use un like a speculum or anything. We just use our hands um, to assess your muscles that are deep in the pelvic floor. Um, pelvic floor sessions can look like working on abdominal massage, working on positioning on the toilet to make sure that it is easier for you to um, have bowel movements, they can look like us spending time reviewing things like a bladder diary in the bottom left there where we look at how many times you're going to the bathroom, what foods and drinks that you're eating that might be contributing to how frequently you're going to the bathroom or your urgency um, with using the bathroom. Once you get a pessary from Brittany, we can practice. If sometimes people feel like maybe they don't have enough time or they... Um, just like forgot what she said in the session. So a lot of times we just review how to insert it, clean it, take it out so that people feel comfortable. Um, we go over reviewing your diet, um, emphasizing for the most part for everyone that the goal is to drink a lot of water to make sure that we are not um, having irritated bladders that are sending us to the bathroom. We take a look at the way that your stool looks when it's coming out. So that's usually the chart, that Bristol stool chart there that kind of um, shocks people a little bit because we are talking about the way that your bowels look when they come out because that gives us a nice idea of your diet, um, how you might be toileting, so how you might be straining to use the bathroom or what might be going on with the sphincters if we feel like the stool is too loose or too hard. And then lastly, we do a lot of work on breathing and being mindful of how our breath affects our pelvic floor. So for a quick um, exercise here, I can't see you guys, um, but if you are at home and you are sitting in a chair, I just want you to try and sit. So she has her legs crossed, but I want you to sit in a chair, sit up. If there's a back, you can bring your back away from the chair. You can place your feet flat on the floor and you can place one hand on your chest and one hand on your stomach. Then we'll start by taking nice deep breaths in through your nose and out through your nose on counts of four. As you're taking those deep breaths in through your nose and out through your nose, you can check and see if your top hand on your chest and your bottom hand on your belly are moving at the same time. You can see if all the work is coming from your shoulders, if when you take a deep breath, you arch your back, and when you exhale, you round your back and sink down. When you exhale and breathe out, you can feel if those abdominal muscles are becoming firm. If when you're exhaling, your pelvic floor is dropping down towards the seat that you're in, or if it's lifting up off the seat. All of those things give us a clue as to what's going on with your muscles and your pelvic floor throughout the day that can let us know if there's certain activities or ways that you're doing things throughout your day that might be contributing to prolapse, for example, or urinary incontinence. Um, but, and that is also just an exercise for you to realize that there's a lot of stuff that we can do in pelvic floor physical therapy that doesn't even involve us actually going towards the pelvic floor. Um, so if that's something that you are not comfortable with, then there's plenty of ways around doing the internal treatment that we can still find to um, improve your pelvic floor function. So um, moving forward, if you're already a patient with Dr. Gruber and Brittany and they've mentioned pelvic floor PT to you before and you haven't necessarily taken the leap to make the appointment, please feel free to reach out to them for a referral. If you're not one of their patients and you do have um, concerns, you can definitely reach out to any practitioner that you feel comfortable with to write you an order for pelvic floor physical therapy. Any of those diagnoses that I listed or Dr. Gruber listed would be appropriate. Um, if you feel like your concerns are best addressed and you can get in to see us a little bit quicker than you can get in to see Dr. Gruber, we are totally fine with facilitating a referral so that we'll just send you right in the elevator straight up to the fourth floor so that you can contact his department. But we're here um, to help and that's all I have for you. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Lola. It was really useful information. Got a couple questions already in the queue and feel free to add an additional question and the Q&A feature below. 
Um, let's start with um, Brittany or Dr. Gruber. What happens if someone has a prolapse and they ignore it? Um, I can start on this, I guess. Um, so sometimes if it's very small, uh, it can stay that way small, um, meaning it's inside the vagina. If, it's, if it hasn't come out yet, then physical therapy uh, and exercises can help and slow down that process. Once it comes out, then unfortunately that those, those conservative things don't help quite as much. Pessaries can maybe slow down a little bit, but they tend to gradually get worse over time. Uh, it's, a, it's a gradual thing. People rarely have all of a sudden things are falling out overnight, um, but most of the time it's a gradual thing. And that's why so many women can just learn to live with it because it's a gradual thing. And it's um, and, and they, they don't realize that it's actually bothering them more than it does. And once we do the pessary or do our procedures, they often quite right away go, oh my God, I, okay, I noticed a big difference because they just got so used to it for so long. On the topic of pessaries, um, are pessaries an option for people who have urgent bladder? Brittany, you wanna take us? Um, so for the urgency, generally we will use it for the prolapse, obviously, but if you have stress-induced incontinence, like with cough, laugh, sneeze, exercise, we have a lot of runners that have come in, um, actually pretty young too, uh, that go in for that. But um, I, only use it for the stress-induced incontinence and for the prolapse. Yeah, the in general, it's not used as much for urgency, but the caveat is if they have prolapse, and usually if it's quite large, then the urgency comes along with that. And so that's one situation that maybe a pessary might help with urgency if it makes them empty their bladder a little better. The pessary, unfortunately, does not help with rectoceles. It kind of sits a bit higher in the vagina, so it doesn't do as much for that. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, Lola, you talked about uh, drinking water and someone said, I really don't like the taste of water. Do I have to be concerned about drinking water from drinking enough fluids between seltzer, coffee, and tea? Um, yes. Um, typically we have to be concerned about the seltzer, the coffee, and tea because caffeine carbonated beverages and alcohol tend to be the biggest what we call bladder irritants they change the ph or the acidity of the urine and they can get your bladder to kind of get revved up so that can send you running to the bathroom a little bit more frequently for some people it's not a big deal it doesn't bother them at all but typically when we have patients that are going to the bathroom too frequently or they're waking up at night then we take a look at what they're drinking and how much and how we can modify that a little bit so that we can decrease some of the irritation on the bladder. There's plenty of people that can drink all of those things in one sitting and have no issues, but usually um, when it does become a problem that it's increasing the frequency of going to the bathroom, that's when we would be concerned about it. Very, very useful. Um, what, speaking of going to the bathroom, I don't know who wants to address this, but what is an average number of times during the day or for those of us who wake up at night, um, a person should be going to the bathroom? Um, well, there's different answers day and night. So it partially depends on their ages. Um, as people get older, as women get older, they go more frequently. So the average in an older woman, say over 65, 70 at night is about twice. Um, that's just because something's average doesn't mean it's not bothersome, but that's typical. Um, and they're younger, it's a little bit less, but everybody's so different on that. Um, if somebody's drinking a ton, uh, you know, if they're drinking a gallon a day, they're going to go every 45 minutes and nothing's wrong. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. So we'll tell people to back down if they're drinking to that level and going that often is bothersome. But you can retrain the bladder. And this is where Lola does such a great job with people. Um, but people naturally train their bladder based on occupation often. Uh, we see physicians and nurses and classically teachers. Uh, if a kindergarten teacher is in a classroom, she can't just leave and leave a bunch of kids alone. So she learns to hold her bladder. And so somebody like that will go three times a day, maybe in the morning, maybe at lunch, and then in the evening. And uh, then other people who, we've seen this a lot, Lily, you, you probably have too, where with the pandemic and people working at home a lot more, they're drinking 
a lot more because they have the stuff next to them and the bathroom's next to them. So they just go and they now they've trained their bladder to go every 45 minutes and suddenly they can't go out to a movie or dinner without going because they trained it up. So we try to get them to hold it longer. Very good information. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked a question about if um, the evaluation by, if evaluation is covered by Medicare. So I'm gonna, gonna guess that you're asking about a physical therapy evaluation, but if you want to, um, or an evaluation, maybe we'll do evaluations with both sets of providers. Um, I do know Sibley does accept many different types of insurances through our physical therapy department, but um, Dr. Gruber or Brittany Lola, maybe you wanna address the process by which people can get a consultation with you or an evaluation. So with the Medicare patients, we do see a significant amount. Um, so at least to my knowledge, I would think that it would be covered pretty significantly. I don't know exact numbers because it kind of depends on what your secondary insurance is. Um, but usually our front desk is pretty good resource wise on that. Um, but yeah, we do see a, a substantial amount of Medicare patients in here. So if that helps. And Lola, I think you laid out a little bit the process on needing um, a referral from a physician or a provider in order to come to physical therapy. But can you just talk just real quickly about that? Um, yeah, in the District of Columbia, physical therapists tend to have, um, no, not tend to, have direct access. So you don't actually need a order, but we try, especially for pelvic floor, because sometimes whoever's reading the insurance has no idea what they're talking about. We'll read it and say like, why are you going to that? I don't really understand what's the medical necessity. So having a referral from a physician or um, Brittany is um, kind of like a backup. And we accept Medicare and Medicaid. There's just a matter of like how many I don't know, sessions or how much your insurance will cover. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of trickiness with some insurances um, if we're only working on pain with intercourse, um, but typically that's my job to be creative with my words and make sure that I can explain why that is medically necessary for us to work on and we usually don't have too many problems. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions that I think maybe can go together here. Can you talk a little bit about fecal incontinence and rectal prolapse? Um, I can start. Um, for rectal prolapse, that's where instead of the vagina falling down, it's so the rectum comes down. Um, and actually, people often will have both at the same time because there's similar support structures that cause both. But co uh, colorectal surgery. Um, does the procedures for rectal prolapse and we'll often we'll do combined procedures uh, with myself and them. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do evaluate for that kind of stuff. Um, uh, Lola, what is your, is, what's your question or what's your answer, I guess, for rectal prolapse? Like, what do you do for that? Um, so for rectal prolapse, that's when we really focus on toileting. Um, we make sure that we are not making it any worse by being constipated or doing a lot of straining or because sometimes with the rest rectal prolapse, if a the bowel movements too tough to get down, um, we're doing a lot of straining and bearing down, which puts more pressure on the prolapse. Um, or if the bowels are too liquidy, sometimes they can pocket and that can feel really uncomfortable. So we usually work on um, emphasizing your posture on the toilet, maybe using a squatty potty or working on your breathing so that the bowel movements are as easy as possible so that we are not putting more strain um, on the prolapse. Yeah, we talk about um, the same stuff a lot with people like using a squatty potty or elevating your feet. Uh, while using the bathroom is, is very helpful. Another technique that we always talk about as well. Um, and then as far as the question with fecal incontinence, that's just leaking stool or staining underwear. Um, and it's just kind of a general catch-all term. Um, some people have it occasionally, some people have it uh, all the time. Um, there's lots of different situations that can cause that, whether it's stools being too soft, like diarrhea type things like um, uh, like if you have irritable bowel or Crohn's disease, sometimes those can have those things. From our perspective or Eurogyne side, a lot of times people who've had previous obstetrical lacerations, like a big laceration, third or fourth degree, which get through all the way into the muscles, 
um, they will leak stool. Um, often years later, they might be fine for five or 10 or 20 years, but then we see them in their 50s and 60s. And, um, and, and I feel really bad for these people. They've been suffering and they, by the time they come see us, they've usually had this for quite a long time, even years. Um, because they just kind of dealt with it and they were embarrassed to bring it up and they didn't think anybody can do anything about it, but we definitely can. Um, we have definitely some treatment options, anything from conservative things to um, electrical stimulation or even a surgical repair of the muscles. Um, so I hope that answers that question. I think one overarching theme that I certainly gleam is you don't have to suffer. There's amazing practitioners who can help you with um, things that just don't feel great in your body. And we're very lucky to have these resources in our community. Um, one question, I think this is probably more for you, Dr. Gruber, do you use mesh in prolapse surgery? Um, yes and no. So first of all, um, mesh has gotten this bad name. I'm on the FDA panel for mesh. Um, so I know a lot about it. Um, it. It has been used for surgery for 50, 60 years in different forms. Unfortunately, over the last 20, 30 years, we've refined it. so that we know the goods and bads about it. Um, a while ago, about 15 years ago, uh, some people were trying to make these prolapse surgeries better and less invasive. So they implanted uh, vaginal mesh. So, so mesh placed via the vaginal route. Um, unfortunately, those, um, those type of uh, procedures uh, had complications with them. I did only a few in training, but 10 years ago, but not many. Um, because they have some issues with them. Um, but the one procedure that I showed earlier is called the sacrocopal uh, That's using an ultra lightweight mesh. We use different sutures. So the, the risks to it um, are much, much less. Um, and so, and that's placed abdominally, not vaginally. So it's a different approach. So the consequences are different. So the answer, the short answer is yes, I do, but in a very specific way that is, uh, that's basically our, our gold standard procedure. Um, but not the kind that uh, that was the the lawsuits and the FDA took off the market. I, I actually hadn't done one seven or eight years before the FDA took it off the market because of the data. See, one more question if anybody has them, feel free to answer. And um, do you deal with prudential nerve neuralgia? I'm sorry, I might not be saying that pr properly or entrapment or other causes of pelvic pain? Yeah, we do. Um, and that's just one of the, the causes. And we, we work very closely with Lola and you can say well, your side of it, Lola too. Um, but yeah, I'll do a lot of, um, I have a lot of experience with pudendal nerve blocks. I do those blocks a lot in our surgeries to help with pain as well, like just surgical pain. Um, and there's, it's a type of um, nerve that runs down the pelvis and, and it kind of innervates the, the labia and the clitoris and the, the, the rectal area. Um, so that's, and people sometimes have a lot of pain that's impinging that nerve, but Lola, what do you, what do you have to say? Um, I think the easiest or the thing that I would say is yes, we treat it, but I think a lot of times the pelvic floor gets like uh, stigmatized that it's like completely different muscles and completely different things going on but just like sciatica that everyone knows is pain that goes down your leg the pudendal nerve is one of the largest nerves in the pelvic floor and we would treat it very similarly so we'd work on making sure it's able to move it doesn't get trapped there's no pressure on it um and pelvic floor therapy is kind of just like regular physical therapy in a warm, dark place. We can't really see what we're doing, but we know that it's there. Um, so we treat the muscles differently, but essentially the idea is the same. So if there's any nerve conditions that are happening in the pelvic floor, we treat them. Thank you all so much. This was incredibly informative. Um, and what we will do is follow this recording up via email to all of the attendees as well, I know we had a couple questions on how people can schedule appointments with you. So we will include the contact numbers that were in these presentations should you um, desire to make an appointment with one of these incredible practitioners. Um, I'm sure you will join me in being very excited to have them in our incredible community hospital. What a resource for us to have um, to support women's health here at Sibley. Um, I wanna thank you 
Lola, Dr. Gruber, and Brittany so much for your time today. All of you who have joined, I want to thank the generous supporters of Sibley Foundation to the specific department, but overarchingly, we're able to do so many creative and innovative and extra extraordinary things because of your support. So thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you.